Okay. So if you were on the two that we did before, where we talked about early stage and mid stage, we have some terms that we use. In the early part of the dementia, uh, any dementias, we tend to use the term normalization, that we want to keep things as normal as we possibly can. We want to work on independence. We want to work on dignity, and make sure that they, our loved ones are able to do for themselves as much as they possibly can. And we want to do that all the way through the disease but that's really the focus of the early stage of dementia. Then in the mid stage of dementia, we kind of shift it more to what we call supportive, a supportive stage of the disease, where we still want them to be able to do as much as they can for themselves, uh, but we're coming right alongside them now and supporting them in that because they're needing assistance now with most every area of their life. And when we get to the late stage or the end stage of the disease, the term that's used most often is this that you see on the screen, and that is sensory, where they are to the point in the disease that the way that they communicate and the way that they understand best is through their senses, all of their senses. And so we'll kind of deep dive into what does that look like. We've used this picture many times and I always put it up at the beginning just as a reminder for us. These are actual photos that are autopsy photos that were taken. The one on the left was a 70 year old man who died in an accident. The one on the right is a 70 year old man who died from end stage Alzheimer's disease. With all of the dementias, we know that the brain cells are dying and that the brain is beginning to atrophy. So the brain's gonna look very similar to this regardless of what type of dementia they have. It gives us a really good idea though, um, and the, the sentence I like to use is, we can't expect that person on the right to act like that person on the left. So as the disease progresses and those brain cells are literally dying, this is why they're losing the ability to take care of themselves, to communicate, that's also though the reason why as we get into the end of the disease, the body can no longer metabolize food, metabolize meds, all of those, because our brain does everything. So there comes a point that, we're, and we're actually gonna talk a lot about it today, at the end of the disease where they may be continuing to eat, but their brain isn't telling that food to metabolize and to support their body anymore because that part of the brain is, not only is it not working, many times it's gone. It isn't even there anymore. And so that's why we use that picture to bring us back and remind us that those brain cells are dying. And that's why. And another one I wanna throw out there while it's on my mind, because I wanna make sure and get it in here, is same thing with medications. So at some point we may go, but an antibiotic has always gotten rid of their urinary tract infection. And then as we get closer to the end of the disease, maybe that antibiotic doesn't work anymore. Well, why isn't it working? Well, look at that brain. That's why it isn't working. Maybe that part of the brain that tells the antibiotic to work isn't even there anymore. Or if it's there, it's not working anymore. So just our real basic, what is dementia? And a lot of this I've put on it just so you'll have it. You know what dementia is if you're already well into the end stage or getting close to the end stage with your loved one. But what I've done is I've put um, one slide on what is dementia, two on early stage, two on mid stage, and the whole rest of this is on late stage, just as a review. And I'll just briefly, um, Keeping in mind that dementia is not the diagnosis, dementia is the umbrella term. So when we hear someone has dementia, if you'll think of it in that same line of someone has cancer, our next question would be what kind or what type of cancer? What kind or what type of dementia? Because there's over 130 different kinds, forms or types of dementia. This is very hard to see on your screen, but again, Jamie is sending this out to you and I encourage you to run this off. In fact, I can't see it on mine. I have to have my paper right here in front of me. The theory of retrogenesis. 
and this gives us a really good idea of the stages, mild, moderate, severe, their skill level and clinical characteristics, and then their approximate developmental age and the abilities and skills. And it's all the way up at the top with no difficulties where you or I are at, and it goes all the way down to the bottom with the loss of the ability to hold up their head. Now that is somebody who lives all the way through to the very end of the disease. Now please hear me when I say this, that only happens about 20% of the time. About 80% of the time, they're gonna pass away from something else. They're gonna pass away with dementia, not from dementia. So not everybody, because people will see this and panic many times. Not everybody's going to go all the way to that part of the disease, keeping in mind that they're going to pass away from heart attack, stroke, uh, their age. Because we've got to keep that in mind, too. If they're already over life expectancy, and right now life expectancy is 81 for a man and 84 for a woman, and let's say they're 90 and they pass away, well, why did they die? Well, they probably died because they were 90 if they weren't at the end of the disease. So keeping in mind that, that life is still going on with them as well. You know, they may have a kidney disease, they may have cancer, so they may very likely and will very likely pass away with dementia, not from it. But this is interesting to have and each of the stages we've looked at this, but this time we're focusing right there on that blue where it says severe. And you'll notice over on the far right um, on abilities and skills, it says enjoy stimulating props that are visual and tangible. So this is where we get into that sensory part, dangling ribbons, textured fabrics, and they will still enjoy music all the way throughout the disease, most people will still enjoy music. You'll also see on here where it says severe and then it says a seven because some people will use this stage that's called a fast stage, F-A-S-T, fast stage. You'll find some doctors that use this stage. And at the seven, this is where it's a complete dependence for all activities of daily living. And most of the time, that's when we can gear or kind of we can decide that somebody is in the later stage of the disease is when they need assistance with every activity of daily living and think about what that is dressing eating toileting bathing groom anything that we do every day an activity of daily living when they are needing assistance with all of those they generally are considered last stage or maybe on that cusp there's kind of a cusp of moderate late so they can be on that cusp also you'll notice on here that um, it compares them from about a one year old all the way down to a one month old getting toward the last stages um, it goes up to a two three year old right there at the end of moderate speech becoming limited to six words or less and it typically will be the first six words that we learned a lot of times so they'll go back to no 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 mama or mommy or daddy home light those words so lots of times you'll see those words be the six words that are left um, Ambulatory abilities lost most of the time later in the disease were to the point that they're no longer walking. So again, if you think and you look at that approximate developmental age as they're going back, 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 what are the things that we were not always doing? We were not always walking. We were not always toileting ourselves. We were not always feeding ourselves. We were not always speaking with words, even though we were always able to make our needs known. So it's us keeping that in mind as they're kind of going back in the disease. That's why they're losing those things. So all of the things that we were not doing as a young child, they lose those. Um, 
sometimes getting to the point where they can no longer sit up or hold their head up. So just as a brief overview, this is the early stages. I did put the two slides in here about the early stages and um, the changes that are normal. And then I put uh, communication tips for somebody in the early stages. And then I did the mo moderate stages and then I did the last stages. So this is just in here, FYI, or if you need to share this with other people. So this is things that we tend to see earlier in the disease starting to lose the proper name, but they'll say something like, you know that thing that writes, but they can't say the word pen. This is where they may start to mix up family members, uh, getting lost, losing their train of thought, repeating themselves. And then communication tips for earlier in the disease is where, and again, keeping in mind that earlier in the disease, we're focusing on the normalization, making sure we keep things as normal as possible not excluding them from conversation, making sure that we find ways to continue to keep them in our conversations, speaking directly to them. And this is where we start learning to slow down. Because as they change in the disease, as they progress through the disease, we are the ones that have to accommodate that disease. They can't. They would if they could. I should have brought my sign over here. I've got my sign in my office. The person with dementia is not giving you a hard time. The person with dementia is having a hard time. They're doing the best they can. So here's the middle stages or the moderate stages, some of the changes we see. Uh, and this is where, as the disease progresses on, uh, they may really start to have trouble remembering family members. Now, again, I want to take you back to what we said earlier about them going back, back, back to being more like that very young child. A young child doesn't have a spouse or children or grandchildren, but they've got a mama and a daddy, and they might have a brother and a sister or an aunt and an uncle. So this is why wives become mamas. And this is why adult sons become daddies, or sometimes husbands, if they still remember they had a spouse, but they didn't have a child. So our grandchildren tend to fall away first, and then the children, and then the spouse, and then we go back to who we were originally. And originally, we had mama and daddy, brother, sister, grandma, grandpa, aunts, uncles, cousins. So they may even start using names of people that you haven't heard in forever, maybe even people you've never heard of. And then you talk to family and find out, well, that was their cousin because that's where they are. And we've got to meet them there. In the middle stages is where they may start to use more, one of my favorite words, confabulation, where they might start to make up some stories uh, so that they can still communicate and they can still be part of the conversation and then loss of impulse control in the middle stages. And then communication tips, again, we're going to really start to slow down even more. This is where we're going to be asking one question at a time. We may ask yes, no questions, but we're not necessarily listening for the yes, no, we're watching because many times they'll say no to everything we say. But then, do you want some ice cream? No, but we put it in front of them and they eat it. So we're watching body language a lot more in the middle stages, and it's getting us ready for this late stage. Uh, we, this is where we learn that validation therapy, where we're repeating back to them what they said, and we're really gonna talk more about validation therapy today. So this is a whole lot on a page. There's two pages like this, but this is where I want us to get into what exactly is late dementia. You'll hear it called end stage, you'll call it severe stage. We're all talking about the, the same thing. It's the very end of the dementia. And this particular um, definition of it came from DementiaCareCentral.com. And if you've never been on that website, that is a really good website that has a lot of information that's broke down very clearly. You can even type in a question, it'll pull up answers to questions but I do want to go over this. I typically do not read a screen to you, but I do want to do this one because I want to share everything that's on here. In late stage dementia, also known as advanced dementia, individuals have significant issues with communication. 
they may not verbally communicate at all. The end stage of dementia is the most difficult stage for those with the disease, but it is also the most difficult stage for family members, for caregivers, and for healthcare professionals. They will very likely forget their family members' names. It's possible that they may think that they're at a completely different time period altogether and revert back to childhood, and that's what we talked about earlier. It will likely be too difficult to walk and extensive help is needed for daily living activities, including personal hygiene and eating. So again, going back to when we were very young, think about how we first were fed. We were fed. And when we first started feeding ourselves, what did we do? Fingers, we used our fingers. And so they will start to use their fingers and that's okay, they're still feeding themselves. We accommodate it by changing their diet to a finger food diet. Because think about how you learned your utensils. We fed ourselves with fingers and then the spoon and then the fork and then the knife. So they will usually lay them down, the knife goes away first and then the fork and then the spoon and then they'll go to fingers. At the end of this stage, the individual will most likely be bedridden and this stage of the disease lasts approximately one to three years. Now we know that that is different with every person. That is the average, one to three years. They require a significant amount of care. They require assistance and supervision 24 hours a day. Uh, dementia uh, patients may require assistance getting in and out of bed, moving from bed to chair, or before this part of the disease is over, they may be bedridden, and they may require help even changing positions to make sure that they don't get skin breakdown or bed sores. And we'll talk about that during this stage because that is something that happens quite often because of them being in the same position for too long. Here's something else. Think about that picture of that brain. The brain is what controls our swallowing. The brain is what controls this flap right here in our throat that says that's water, that's air, that's food. And it gets to where it doesn't work as well anymore. So swallowing becomes an issue late in the disease. And we have to make sure that their food is appropriate. So they may change from a regular diet to what's called a soft diet yogurt, applesauce, to a pureed diet. And many times we have to start thickening their liquids so that they don't choke on their liquids. But at some point, the individual will be 100% dependent on their caregiver and will no longer be able to complete any of their daily living activities alone. Not all families are equipped to offer this level of care and that's where there are other options for care, such as hiring caregivers or moving to a nursing home. Now this one I put in big bold print because this is about us as the caregivers. The end stage of dementia is tough on everyone involved in the love and care of the person with the disease and experts acknowledge family members must care for themselves during this incredibly demanding time in their lives as they too must acknowledge the beginning of the end of their loved one's life. So the beginning of the end stage of the disease is where we as caregivers have been living in, honestly, we've been living in a state of grief from the time that we even thought that this what is what might be happening with our loved one. From the first time it crossed our mind, could it be dementia? we immediately went into denial. No, 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 no. It's something else, it's something else. Well, as they enter into this last stage of the disease, we're gonna do the very same thing where that denial comes back. Are we here? Are we finally at this stage? Is this really what's happening? And we start to deal with that this is the final stage of the disease. 
So let's get into some of the specific changes that we're going to see late in the disease. Now, if you're looking at this and you're saying, wait a minute, my loved one did that way back there when they were still, remember this disease is very individual uh, and your loved one may have done this at the end part of the early stage or right in the moderate stage because we don't have that checkbox with this disease. But these are some of the things that we tend to see later in the disease. So difficulties communicating, we're actually gonna do a couple of slides completely on communicating, so I'm gonna come back to that. But weight loss. So I've already talked about weight loss uh, in the point that the brain is what metabolizes the food. As the brain cells are dying, uh, they may do one of two things. They may stop eating or stop even wanting to eat, or we may get to the point that they're eating, but they're just not gaining weight. Sometimes the doctors will put them on an appetite stimulant, and for some people that helps for a little while. And then you might do things like adding sugar because we know that sweet stays. And so you may catch yourself, I have done this a million times, putting sugar in mashed potatoes and stirring up sugar into mashed potatoes. Now that sounds gross to us, but if you can taste it, you're way more likely to eat it. And if you can't taste it, why would I eat this? or even taking a sugar packet and sprinkling it over the entire plate so that they're getting that taste of sweet because we know that they can taste sweet. Uh, using protein powder, that's another thing that a lot of people will do is they'll start to use a protein powder in their drinks or even sprinkling it on, it doesn't have a taste, putting it on food. Keeping in mind that we're gonna do everything we can, but there does come a time where regardless of what we do, they're going to lose weight. Seizures is on here as well, and this is something that is fairly common at the end of the disease, and that's because of all the chemical changes that are happening in the brain where a person might start to have seizures. So should that happen, one of the reasons we put all of this on here, again, it isn't to scare you, it's so that if that happens, you've got a note in your head where you go, you know what, I remember hearing that that this could happen at this stage of the disease. Skin, inf skin infections, I talked about a little bit earlier. This is where we wanna make sure that they're changing positions at least every two hours to keep the skin from breaking down. And if you don't know how to safely move somebody or to safely position someone, this is where you can talk to your doctor and ask them for a physical therapy or an occupational therapy evaluation for your loved one if your loved one's at home, they will come in the home and they will show you how to safely move, lift, and position your loved one. Please, 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 as caregivers who have loved ones at home, do not try doing something yourself that you don't know how to do. So the staggering statistic, many of you know this because I preach it, you have heard it over and over, those of you that are on our programs all the time, 68% of the time, the caregiver dies before the person with dementia. I had somebody in one of my groups who broke her own hip while trying to help her husband in the shower. To her demise, she, she couldn't come back from it because she, her immune, immunity was so down, she couldn't come back from it. And she was just trying to give her husband a shower uh, you may have had things happen yourself where because you were trying to position or pull or move or whatever it was, you are the one that ends up getting hurt to keep from hurting them. But there's ways to do it and therapy can teach you how to do it, physical therapist and occupational therapist. So we don't ever want to pull on their arms or legs. And the other thing that happens, and this happens to all of us as we get older, you know, you can lift up the skin on the back of your hand and most of us can go, boy, that looks a lot different than it used to because we are losing those fat pads that are on the back of our hands. But their skin becomes very, very thin and it will, I always compare it to tissue paper. It will rip and tear like tissue paper. It will even roll like tissue paper. So we've got to be really, really careful with skin. If you do get a skin tear, making sure to wash it with soap and water and then to blot it dry, to pat it, not rub it with a towel. Same thing whenever we're doing a shower um, is to make sure we blot 
dry and not rub or scrub. That might feel good on us, but that actually can be a reason that we start to have some behaviors in the bath or in the showers because it hurts, because it doesn't feel the same anymore. We want to make sure and do a daily skin check because just getting someone in and out of a bed, they may end up with a bruise, they may end up with a small little tear from our fingernail, from our ring that we had no idea, we did not realize that we'd even done it. Um, and that can become infected. And again, if the antibiotics aren't working, that is the last thing we want to have happen is have them become septic because of a tear or something that happened that maybe we could have prevented if we'd have been being a little bit more careful or if we'd have been trained properly. There's the difficulty swallowing again where we may have to thicken the liquids to keep them from choking. Now here's how you can tell if somebody is beginning to have problems with swallowing. The way that usually it will usually uh, show up is they'll start to, it sounds like they're clearing their throat after each bite or drink. <clears throat> and it may be something as subtle as that where they take a, <clears throat> and that's a reflex. That's their body. We would do the same thing where we might really cough to try to get that food back up. Their body may just do a little, <clears throat> and you'll hear it after every bite or after every drink. That tells you right there they're having an issue swallowing. If you see that happening, you can tell your doctor this and they can actually do a referral to what's called ST or speech therapy. And people hear speech and think that they're gonna just work on their speech. They work with their swallowing as well. So you can ask for a referral for a speech therapist and they can actually do a swallow test or a swallow study to see how well they're swallowing. Something else that you may start to see happen is more groaning, moaning, or grunting. So again, earlier we talked about that, that very young child making their needs known. They might not be able to make their needs known with words, but all of us who are parents or who are grandparents, um, that little child can make their needs known. I've got a friend right now. Uh, who has a new grandbaby that was born on the 4th of July, and that baby has colic, and that baby's making its needs known and has no words, but she's definitely making her needs known because she's crying and she's yelling and she's grunting and she's moaning and she's groaning. So everything they do is some type of communication, and the very first thing we want to assess for is pain because they are not going to be able to say at this point, you know, I've been sitting here for two hours sitting like this and my uh, shirt is twisted and it feels like it's rubbing it. That's reasonable and rational behavior. They can't do it, but they can sit there and furrow their eyes or scrunch up their face or make fist or maybe kick or moan. And then we've got to check head to toe what's going on. Do they just need to be repositioned or is it, are they constipated? Do they have a urinary tract infection? This is where we've got to really tune in to them. You will start to see increased sleeping in the later stages of the disease. This is completely normal. The body needs to rest. As long as they're sleeping at night, you're going to see them start to sleep more in the day. Now, if they switch their days and nights, then their circadian rhythm is out of order and that's where you intervene. But I will have people say, well, Holly, they're, they're going to sleep at six o'clock at night and they're not getting up till 10 the next morning. But then they're up during the day, they may be taking some cat naps. That is just the body starting to rest more and that's okay. Some more changes late in the disease. We talked about loss of mobility. Now we do want to do the best that we can to help them keep from having what's called their joints freezing freezing of joints, and we can do a range of motion activities with them, range of motion exercises. And again, this is where you get that physical therapy, occupational therapy referral, and they can actually come into the home and teach you how to do those safely so that you don't hurt them and you don't hurt yourself, and you can help them um, try to keep their joints from freezing. Sundowning, we talk a lot about sundowning kind of in that mid or moderate stage. With some people, you will still see some sundowning in the late stage. Aggressive reactions. 
and this usually is when we're trying to get them to do something they don't want to do, but we want them to do. And all the way through the course of the disease, they can still get very aggressive, just like a very small child can still get aggressive. Now, one thing that you might start seeing somebody do later in the disease is what I'm doing right here. Just think of what, what I'm doing, I'm rocking. A repetitive motion, because I'm self-soothing. What do we do when we're taking care of that little one? We rock them, we hold them, we pat, and that's what they're doing. So rocking is self-soothing. Repetitive motion is self-soothing. Repetitive words, repetitive actions of any kind, many, many times is self-soothing at this stage. And I've got on here repeating words as soothing repetition. Even if that word is something like, no, 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 no. What's the difference in that and us humming a tune as we're patting the baby? They're self-soothing. We're actually going to watch a, a video uh, where we really see that in, a, in an actual person. Hallucinations can still be going on at this stage in the disease, just restlessness and then that excessive hand activity where their hands seem to be picking. Because people say they're just picking. They pick at their skin, they pick at their clothes. This is where things like a fidget mat or a fidget cuff are really, really good. Uh, something that has different textures, because remember we said they're sensory, we're wanting to reach out and get through to them with their senses. Things that are fleece, you can buy or make. I have got the most wonderful group of ladies who make a fidget, I've got fidget placemats uh, where we sit them in front and they've got all different kinds of textures and things just for people to touch. You can buy them online, you can make them. Uh, they may even make mats that are like the size of a placemat that are filled with water. And as you push them, the colors change in it. And so it's visual and it's tact, they can touch it. The more changes and some of these repeat about having the round the clock care, language is breaking down, uh, usually less than 10 words, it's normally about six. Uh, now, not only are they having a hard time making their needs known, but they're also having a hard time understanding what we're saying to them, even more so than before. So we tend to want to do things in these big descriptive sentences, and we need to bring our sentences down to two to three words, where we may just be using something very, very simple like right here, sit here, let's eat very, very simple. They're going to use their actions and behaviors as their main forms of communication, and they may not know that you are wife or husband or son or daughter, but they will always know you are someone important. I promise you that. I've been doing this a long time. I've sat with well over 200 people as they've died, and they always know their family. They may think you're the nurse, but they know you're somebody important because what does the nurse do? The nurse takes care of me and loves me. They will know that you're someone important. They will be able to pick up on your gestures. They'll pick up on your facial expressions. They will pick up on your tone. They will pick up on your body language even after they have a flat affect on their face. And we know this is true because we know their amygdala stays intact inside of their brain. We know that because of autopsy studies, on hundreds of people who've donated their brains for, towards research, research toward dementia. That hippocampus goes away, those facts go away, but those feelings stay. So they are always there. The feelings and emotions stay. I've also got on here incontinence and that again, that's one of those things. We have not always been going to the bathroom and they're gonna get back to the point where they are incontinent of bowel and bladder. But one of the best things you can do is just get on a toileting schedule, just like when we were uh, teaching children to go to the bathroom and maybe we were taking them every two hours. We want to have them on a toileting schedule where we're checking them. Never, never, never let somebody sit in a wet brief. And I'm using the word brief because adults don't wear diapers. That's a dignity thing. We don't put adults in diapers. Adults wear briefs or um, panties. I just will say panties. Uh, but 
keeping in mind just that dignity. And adults really don't wear bibs either. Adults wear clothing protectors, by the way. Children wear bibs. Um, so having a toileting schedule and making sure they're not sitting in wet, because what happens when we're sitting in wet, just like on a child, you get skin breakdown. And we never want to get a skin breakdown that then gets infected, that then becomes septic. So what to expect, some common changes that we also see. One of the things I've got on here with the feeding on this is when you're assisting somebody with eating is to watch for pocketing in the cheeks. If you're continuing to shovel it in and their cheeks are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, they're not swallowing that food, that's called pocketing. They're keeping it in their cheeks. It's gonna take them a lot longer to eat because their brain, where we just can shovel it in while we're talking, while we're driving, while we're doing, they can't. They can do one thing at a time. So at the end of the disease also is where we're not necessarily trying to have a conversation with them while we're assisting them with a meal because they're gonna need to concentrate on eating. Now we might say open or bite and we're showing them bite and the spoon bite. And we may even chew and we're looking at them, we're looking in their eyes so that they'll mirror what we are doing, but we've got to give them time. It may take 45 minutes to do a meal and that's okay. We accommodate the disease, they can't. They would if they could. Give them time to chew and swallow. Their fine motor skills, likely at this stage in the disease, they've lost the majority of their gross motor skills, but they'll really start losing the fine motor skills and you'll see them start to grip more like this, where if we were to put a spoon, they may hold it more like this instead of, there's my hand, this. With these virtual backgrounds, it's hard to see. <laughs> it's hard to see our hand. Um, but we can still give them finger foods, foods that are big enough that they can hold. Uh, for the sake of time, a lot of these I'm not going to hit on, but you're going to get all of these because some of these do repeat a little bit. So they're going to become more and more vulnerable to infections as the disease progresses. And one of the reasons they're more vulnerable to infections is simply because they're not up and moving around. Think about this. I had my knee replacement in February and they had me up that day. I walked on my new knee that afternoon. But they also were in there making me do those deep breathing exercises. If you've ever had any kind of surgery, they come in and they want you doing that breathing because of pneumonia. So when somebody isn't up and moving as much, they're at a higher risk of pneumonia. They're also at a higher risk of UTIs. And this is throughout the course of the disease. But this is another reason we don't want them sitting in wet clothes is because of UTIs. Men and women will get way more UTIs with dementia. Another thing we want to try to do, and this is one where sometimes you have to choose your battles, is to keep their teeth and mouth as clean as possible. And it may get to the point that they're just not having a toothbrush, but they might let you get some gauze and do a finger, or they might do that themselves, or you might be able to get them to just rinse after a meal. And one of the reasons we want to try to do this again is just bacteria. So uh, for caregivers, families, and friends, some of the things that we can expect and some of the things that we can focus on. Our goal is gonna switch over to preserving quality of life and dignity at this stage. You are still able to connect with your loved one, but you switch and the way you connect is through touch, sound, sight, taste, smell. If you're always the person who shows up with the ice cream, and a smile, all right, you're the person I wanna see. Continue to use music. Their music may change, keeping in mind where they are on that um, theory of retrogenesis. So the music that they liked when they were in their 40s might not be the music that they liked when they were in their teens or when they were a little child. Sing Christmas carols, it doesn't matter if it's August. Christmas carols are fantastic all year long. You are my sunshine. That's one of our favorite songs to sing. Go back and sing those songs from childhood. Read to them. Read books that have meaning. Read to them from the Bible. 
read to them from something that you know that there's going to be that connection. Looking at old photos, we want to look at the photos of the grandbabies because that's important to me right now. But they don't necessarily know exactly who that is. Now they might want to look at photos of the babies because babies are fun. We look at photos of babies and animals. But see if you can find photos of their family, the old black and white photos of them when they were a young child or their mama and their daddy or their brothers and sisters. You can rub scented lotion on their skin very carefully, very gently. Brushing hair also is soothing with a lot of people. Sitting outside in the sunshine and doing something as simple as holding their hand. Again, think about what brings comfort to a young child when they are in distress. Most people, there's always exceptions, but most people touch is big, touch is huge. And we tend to stop touching people with dementia when we need to be touching them more. And we're the ones that tend to want to feel the silence. It's okay to just sit and hold hands and sit outside. We don't have to talk because keep in mind they can have one thought at a time. So we want to focus on sensory, sensory approach and sensory abilities. I put my little quote on here that I'm saying all the time about they're not giving you a hard time, they're having a hard time. So some caretaking tips uh, at the late stage being transferred back and forth between hospitals and nursing homes or hospitals and home in the last days of life has actually been proven to be detrimental to their health. It causes distress and confusion as well as increases the number of serious health complications. And most families get to the point that they finally say, we're done. No more hospitals. We're not doing it anymore. Because if you've had to be in the hospital with your loved one, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Hospitals are not equipped to handle people with dementia, and many times they end up either restraining them or uh, physically or chemically restraining them, and then we see them take a dip in their dementia, and it causes them so much distress that it actually, and this was on that same site that I had quoted earlier, where there's research that shows that they actually end up having more health complications from that back and forth, back and forth. And not only does the person with dementia have more health complications, the caregiver has more health complications. And I see some of you shaking your head yes, because you know exactly what I am talking about when you've had to stay at the hospital with your loved one that has dementia. Patients who were transferred to hospitals in the late stage of the disease are two times more likely to end up in ICU and three times more likely to develop bed sores. Now let's think about why in the world they'd end up in ICU. Hospitals are about saving lives. Saving lives, saving lives, saving lives. And we have somebody who has a terminal illness. And many times we've already made the decision, they already made the decision that we don't wanna be on life support that we want this disease to run its course. But then we get in the hospital and something happens and the next thing we know, they're in ICU. And they end up spending their last days in ICU instead of at home or at the facility where they had been placed in a more loving, I've got two pictures that I show when I'm doing end of life and it's somebody dying basically on life support and then dying in a bed with their family around them. <laughs> It's a terminal disease. The late stage of the disease is the time to consider hospice and hospice, like I said, we've got a uh, next month is all on hospice. Hospice does not mean they are dying today or that they're dying right now. It means that we think they have less than six months or less, but I've known people who've been on hospice for two and three years because each time it's time to recertify, they're a little bit worse because this is a progressive disease. You can also go on and off of hospice. It's not something to be afraid of. It's a wonderful service. It's a Medicare benefit, and a lot of people don't realize that either, that it's not going to cost anything out of pocket to be on hospice. And that's when we shift to where our goal is to be as comfortable as possible and to retain quality of life. And please hear this if you don't hear anything else, and I won't get on my soapbox, but feeding tubes do not extend dementia patients' lives. Rather, they complicate their death. 
the very first system that shuts down when we are dying a natural death, if they're going through and they are just dying, the first system that shuts down is digestion. Now imagine what's gonna happen if we put a feeding tube into somebody whose digestive system is stopping. I've watched it happen. It's not good. And then you're signing the paper to have it taken out of them. And then we've put them through that and we've put ourselves through that. That's why I applaud you for being on this today and educating yourself about this stage of the disease. Feeding tubes do not extend the life of a dementia patient. So with communication, nonverbal communication is our key. Um, please don't talk about them like they're not there or talk over them. They are still there. That amygdala is intact. They are still understanding. Even if they can't react, they are still understanding. It might not look like it, but we know that they are. We've got to speak very slow. We've got to keep eye contact, keeping in mind that their field of vision has changed and it's just going to be right here in front of them. It's almost like a monocle. Tifa Snow teaches, it's like a monocle. They'll get to where they're not turning their head, but they may turn their whole body at this point. So we've got to stay in that field of vision. Being very aware of the environment, using visual cues, and please, 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 during this time, don't pull away. This is where we want to get as close to them as we can. I want to make sure and get to this video, so I'm going to go through these pretty quick. But right here on the bottom, it says 90% of all communication is nonverbal. So again, this has been on all of the ones from the uh, early stage to the mid stage to the late stage. We're sure not going to try to reason, argue, confront, remind them that they forgot or question their memory. And we cannot take this personally. Now, I think this is huge, these three. They are saying normal things and doing normal things for somebody with dementia. Everything that they're doing is a normal part of the disease. We can't control the disease, but we can control how we react to the disease. And then a symptom of this disease is memory loss. Jamie says this all the time. I love it. They cannot remember that they cannot remember that they cannot remember. So as there is no reason for us to try to remind them that they can't remember because they can't remember that they can't remember that they can't remember. This also is something that we teach throughout the course of the disease. We need to get rid of that word remember uh, using the word okay. Now toward the end stages of the disease, we want to use a lot of reassurance words. It's okay. I'm here with you. We're in this together. I've got you. Think about how you would reassure that child. I may not be using that exact um, tone, or I might be using that exact tone, depending on the situation. And I might be sitting with my arm around and rocking with them. I've got you. We're okay. We've got this. And that may be all that, that may be our interaction. Distract with food, music, animals, and children. So validation therapy, and this is where I want to show this um, real brief video. Validation therapy is used to validate or accept your loved one's reality, even if it doesn't make a bit of sense to you. And I'm going to show you the video of a lady who is in a nursing facility who had got to the point that a lot of the staff did not want to work with her because they thought that she was hitting and that she was being aggressive. And a lady came in who is an expert. In fact, Jamie, did she in, kind of invent using that word validation therapy? She's like the founder of it. And she shows them what was actually going on with this sweet lady. Um, if you have a little Kleenex nearby, you might want, let me give you a heads up because the first time I watched this, nobody told me uh, it's precious. I think it's precious. It's one of my favorite videos. So I am going to switch. and Let's see if we can get this to work. So I'm going to stop sharing and put this down and start sharing. Can you see it, Jamie? Yeah. Okay, let's see if you can hear it now. Can you hear it? When people are very old and deteriorated and no one enters their world and they're just sitting there, 
they will withdraw inward more and more. And their desperate need for, for connection is all now inside. And if a person is all alone, even if they're very, very deteriorated, there's a longing for this kind of closeness. Mrs. Wilson, hello. You want me to sit? Can you see me good? Gladys Wilson is a wonderful example of a person who was in the phase of repetitive motion where people use movements, repetitive movements, because they don't have any more speech or very little speech, but they have human needs that need to be expressed. You're crying. You're crying, you have a tear right here in your face. You have a little pain, you want me to touch you. You're very sad. Can you see me? Is it scary? Are you afraid? And if this person sits with their eyes closed, rocking back and forth, and maybe there's a tear coming down, there's a need there. Here. There's a little tear that's coming out. Do you feel it? You feel a little tear? If you gently use touch, and I touched Gladys Wilson for the fingertips right here on the cheek is where the mother usually touches a child. If you touch an infant there, it looks up, and every cell remembers where it was touched by the mother. And often that person knows, even if they can't say a word at that moment, they won't talk, but, or they don't want to talk, but they, there's, there's a communication. And that person is no longer alone. Can you let me in a little bit, you think? Just a little? You think I could be with you and Jesus for a minute? Jesus loves me, yes, I know. For the Bible tells me so. I used music, because when speech is gone, Music, especially with Gladys Wilson, it was religious music because there's emotion tied to it and safety tied to it. So I used her old church songs. Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. What I did was, when she moved, I moved with her. Yes. And when I was singing, because she didn't sing with me, yes. so I matched the intensity of my voice to the intensity of her movement. Yes. And pretty soon, for a split second, we became one person. Yes. Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. So at one point, when she got very quiet and very peaceful, and my voice became very quiet as hers and very peaceful and my breathing slowed to her breathing. She pulled me to her and I moved with her. And for her at that moment, I believe I was a symbol of, of her mom. Can you open your eyes now? Do you see me? Feel safe and warm? Yes. Can you sing with me? He's got the whole world in his hands. 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 He's got the mothers and the fathers. He's got the mothers and the fathers. He's got the mothers and the fathers. He's got the whole world in his head. The breakthrough doesn't happen every time. The person will not always look their open their eyes and look at you. 
But if you keep trying and you send, keep centering yourself and uh, really look at that person and really mirror their movements, maybe not this time, but the next time you come, you'll have a communication. You feel safe? You feel safe? Yeah. With Jesus? Yeah. And me? I don't know if you noticed, but earlier in that video, if you were to look at her face, it didn't look like she, if you'd have just seen her hitting, you could see where maybe people had got to where, well, they didn't want to work with her anymore. She hits. She wasn't hitting. That was rhythmic. And look at that connection that she was able to make with her. That I've seen that dozens of times and still tear up every time when that sweet lady starts singing that song because she hadn't said any words, but nobody tried to communicate with her like that. That is validation therapy. And I know we're right at our time. I've got, I think, two more slides. So this is what validation therapy is. It's responding to their feelings rather than their words because you saw her at one point really start pat, pat, patting on her. That wasn't hitting. That was rhythm. And you saw that she started singing to her beat. She was keeping up with her. That was somebody at the end stage of the disease. You could clearly tell from looking at her, she very likely can't do very much for herself. She might be able to do some finger foods, maybe but there was still a connection to be made. Use their words and gestures, going with the flow. Um, sometimes we have to walk away and leave the room. That's okay. But don't get caught up in whether something makes sense or not. Their emotions are still valid. And this is how we treat dementia. You're doing it right now. You're educating yourself about this disease. You're continuing to build your skills. <laughs> making quality of life important, important, practicing, and being compassionate. So if anybody has uh, any questions, we will sure take a few minutes to answer any questions. I see there's stuff in the chat box. Uh, yeah, we had some chat going on while you were chatting. Consider to sit. Yeah, yeah, with the um, whistling, that sure could. That could be self-soothing, absolutely. Would be difficult to work in spots. And Holly, I, will, I want to add because I we show that video to our staff as well. You want to fly us in, Naomi? Um, even and, and Naomi said the breakthrough doesn't work all or doesn't you don't connect all the time. You don't get the feedback all the time, um, right? But I I tell our staff because I believe this a hundred percent. Just because you didn't get the feedback or they didn't respond the way you were hoping doesn't mean you didn't make a connection. Right, you still could have connected with them. They just weren't able, or maybe they didn't want to provide feedback that we were hoped for. Right, so even if you're not getting that response, okay. continue to still connect with them. Because that's the best way to treat this disease, especially at the late stages. Mm -hmm. and, and I agree 100% that, you know, we don't always get that moment where we go, oh my gosh, the breakthrough we got through. but maybe you did and they just weren't able to show it. Judy, thank you for putting that on there about some nursing homes are not equipped to care for persons with dementia. Not every place is. Uh, make certain you check out a nursing home you're looking at to make certain their services understand and can take care for someone. And that is speaking from experience. My friend Judy is speaking there from experience. Um, does anybody have anything else? And if you think of something later or if there's something you want to share with us offline or you've got a question, You've got our emails, you've got our phone numbers. Jamie will send these slides later today. Uh, we hope that you'll join us next month, first Wednesday of next month, which is the 2nd of August, uh, September, uh, where we'll have an entire program on hospice. Um, and then we've got a support group starting at one o'clock if anybody would like to jump on for that. Does anybody have anything before we go? Judy, I see your mouth moving, but I can't hear you. still showing that you're muted. 
I bet it's doing like it did last week where you have to go out and come back in. Anybody have anything else? Well, thank you so much for being on here with us and staying over a few extra minutes. I think that was a, um, it's a, it's a, it's a powerful topic to talk about and I appreciate you being here. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.